Welcome back. We are live from our Cincinnati showroom. I'm Palmer, the Marketing and Creative Director here at Everything But The House. We have an extra special preview tonight as we share some highlights from our marquee auction of the season, the Autumn Land. Welcome back. We are live from our Cincinnati showroom. I'm Palmer, the Marketing and Creative Director here at Everything But The House. We have an extra special preview tonight as we share some highlights from our marquee auction of the season, the Autumn Landmark Collection, representing the most rare and most sought after items. Each season, we partner with our network of dealers, consigners, and estates to curate a selection of outstanding pieces. This is a unique opportunity to own the truly remarkable. This edition of our Landmark Collection crosses all of our categories from art to cars, antiques to fashion, and does not disappoint. So far, we have more than 80,000 follows and almost 8,000 uh, bidders from across the globe. 27 countries are already represented. So let's jump in and we'll share uh, real quick the, the list of the most followed items. First up, we have a fun 1949 Dodge Woody that is currently the most followed item and a very rare vehicle. We also, from the jewelry category, have a platinum ring with a two and a half carat uh, princess cut center stone. That's a real stunner. <laughs> it is. A really unique wrought iron and glass door from the early 1900s is getting a lot of attention in the decor category. We also have a rare Clemens Orange Hermes Birkin bag, and that bag already has 100 bids. There's also a large and sparkling cut glass orb chandelier leading decor. And we have a baller oven in range from Thermador, new and in the box. It has people ready for a kitchen remodel. There's also a rare opportunity to own an incredible masterwork from Robert S. Duncanson, which is among the most followed in our art collection. We also have two Edward Pothas paintings and a Henry Faulkner, um, which we will be highlighting later tonight. There are some great timepieces in the collection as well. Uh, the stainless steel Cartier Roadster is currently the most followed. So, thanks ladies. Uh, Kara is going to stay on and we're going to get started with that painting we were just talking about, the most followed and the one that we're uh, all pretty excited about. Give us a second, we're going to slide this out. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Meredith. All right, so we are really excited about this opportunity to offer the stunning painting by the renowned African-American landscape paper, painter, excuse me, Robert S. Duncanson. He was a Cincinnati-based artist and the first African-American artist uh, painter to gain international acclaim. So yeah. this is a really big deal. And an impressive, uh, impressive uh, feat back then. So mm -hmm. what, uh, where is this landscape? Do we know the location? Uh, we don't know the exact location, but it does, it, it possibly features a southern landscape. It was painted circa 1850 to 1852, mm -hmm. and you can see it's executed in the Hudson River School style, and really exhibits his style of the 1850s with the, you have a lot of blue and uh, red tones. Um, it is possible that Duncanson did go back a couple years later and re rework some things. And that's something he did to improve his technique and appeal to European and, and um, American trends at the time. And uh, I noticed this frame's pretty remarkable it as well. It is absolutely, I mean, amazing frame. <laughs> something it, it really needs to be brought to attention here. This is the original gilt frame, and you can see it has these arched inner edges. Um, that was a frame style that adorned a lot of Duncanson's paintings from the 1850s. Um, we have some photography that shows the painting unframed, and if you look at the upper corners, you can see the areas of this part of the canvas is left unpainted, and that was actually a telltale for, for his paintings. Yeah, I mean, this is, an impre I mean, this is a significant work. It yeah? really, really is. We were so excited about it in this landmark sale. When I heard that we got it in, my, my jaw dropped. <laughs> I mean, I studied this artist a lot when I was in school. Um, but it was also a pleasure working with Michael Francis Meyer, who uh, actually studied the painting um, around 2006 uh, with the Robert Duncanson scholar Joseph Kettner, who is uh, no longer alive. But he provided his opinion about the authenticity of the work, so we know it's good. So. Right on. So yes. 44 bids already. Uh, I mean, I've really enjoyed learning about Duncanson and having this piece around the warehouse. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Kara. We'll slide this off this way. And let's jump to a, uh, another piece that has uh, Cincinnati roots. So uh, what's so unique about this piece of Rookwood, Meredith? 
Have you ever seen a piece of rookwood this large? <laughs> I have not. <laughs> I was shocked when I saw it. I think I actually screamed. <laughs> um, I personally love pottery, so that's why I'm so excited to tell you about this piece. I've been following rookwood for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, I think as Cincinnatians, we all have a familiarity with the rookwood brand, so kind of what's the story here? That's right. So rookwood pottery, in response to the aesthetic of the arts and crafts movement, created its soft and milky or frosted looking vellum glaze in 1904 and was very successful. The vase slip cast in jewel porcelain, like the majority of their wares, was decorated by Carl Schmidt in a beautiful landscape of trees descending down the hillside. Schmidt was born in Germany in 1875 and began decorating vases at Rookwood in 1896. He worked at Rookwood Pottery until 1927 and is most known for his landscapes and marine scenes. Yeah, super cool. So this uh, it closes Sunday night and is at 31 bids with $1,300. Uh, all right, so an impressive start to the Landmark highlights. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, I think it's time to share some of the incredible jewelry in the sale. Uh, just a reminder, uh, chat us any questions and comments as we go. Come on in, guys. Uh, we'll do our best to get an answer. And uh, Jen, it looks like you have a guest with you this evening. I do. Hi, Palmer. Yes, I am so excited that we have one of our favorite gemologists here from EBTH, Tanya Moore. And she's going to be here to talk with us this evening about really an impressive selection of jewelry in this sale. Hi, Tanya. Hello. Oh, it's so nice to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Um, to get started, will you just give us a kind of a brief description about um, the gemology department yeah. and, and the yeah. process that these things go through here at EBTH? Yes. yes. So I love being at EBTH because I am one of eight graduate gemologists here. Um, that is a lot of gemologists to have in yes. one place. Uh, to give you an idea, a lot of uh, jewelry stores have no gemologists, or they may have one, or rarely even two. But eight is unheard of. So what's wonderful is not only do we get to see these incredible pieces, but we get to evaluate them together. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to really fine uh, gemstones and jewelry, you want to be sure that you're getting what you're being told you're getting. Absolutely. So, it, so, so our, our, our bidders can absolutely bid with confidence absolutely. that yeah. uh, these things are yes. represented appropriately. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we do have this tray of 18 karat gold jewelry here, and there's a lot of pieces on this tray that are by one of my favorite designers, mm -hmm. uh, Roberto Coyne, and I love the way he hides a little teeny tiny ruby in each, uh, in each piece of jewelry that he designs. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that are yes. on this tray. Yes, so I know that um, Jennifer would love Roberto Coyne because of all the beautiful detailing that's done in those pieces. These are both from the Elephantino collection. Um, he always uses 18 karat gold. He is a master of fine pieces that are timeless, mm -hmm. exquisite, fashion forward, but timeless at the same mm -hmm. time. Beautiful, um, always very, very white diamonds and just a look that never goes out of style. Oh, that's awesome. Love that about it. I think there's a sapphire that's also on yep. this tray. It's what, nearly seven carats. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, it's an unheated sapphire, which is special. Yes. Yes. And you're the person to tell us about yeah. that. Yes. Unheated sapphires represent only about 5% wow. of the world's finest sapphires. So we're not even talking about sapphires in general. If you take the finest sapphires in the world, 95% of them are still heated, only 5% are not. Wow. So this beauty is not. Um, it didn't need to be heated because it came out of the ground looking like this. Beautiful blue, so well um, able to see through it, beautiful transparency to it. Um, and they did it justice by putting a couple of gorgeous diamonds on, flanking it too. So a rare piece. Very rare piece. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And then I see we also have, um, that's kind of a showstopper, the ring in the center. Yes. So we have a gorgeous green tourmaline and this is a massive tourmaline, really fantastic. And it is, flat. this is what we call a ballerina setting, a beautiful setting named because it literally looks like a, a tutu on a ballerina. So very beautiful, very classic piece. And then an absolutely outstanding ruby too. Um, rubies are hard to get these days. Beautiful rubies are extremely hard to get. In fact, rubies will price higher than some of the finest diamonds because of their rarity. So again, a completely exquisite, very clear, very beautiful ruby. That is, that's pretty great. Yeah. Well, obviously beautiful jewelry, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step back here and um, pick up this handbag and bring it up to talk a little bit about this uh, orange, actually it's called the Hermes Clements orange yeah. uh, Birkin handbag. And uh, first of all, the color. How, Beautiful. Can you go wrong? With any neutral, absolutely yeah, exquisite. Absolutely. Yep. A big pop of color, but again, you can wear it with just about anything. And yep. I love the story about how the Birkin bag was kind of born. Um, 
1984, it's Jane Birkin. She's on an international flight, and she just happens to be sitting next to Jean-Louis uh, Dumas, who is the creative director of Hermes at the time. Uh, her purse spills. Everything falls out. She's frustrated. And so she's talking to Jean-Louis Dumas about the fact that she can't find a structured handbag to her liking. So the two of them are sitting on this international flight, and they design this handbag on the back of an air sickness bag. So, fun story, <laughs> great handbag. These are just, you know, a, a wardrobe staple, and this one is pretty spectacular. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there we have it. Awesome. It looks like there was a, uh, a comment uh, about doing men's jewelry sales in the future, and I know you kind of chatted to the right people. I think Jen, Kara, Meredith, and I will, um, will be sure. There's always men's jewelry on the site uh, pretty much any day of the week, uh, and I think the idea of putting a men's specific piece together would be great. So we'll definitely look into that. Thank you for the comment. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you, uh, Tanya. Uh, and now Kara and Meredith are going to come out and uh, show us our next painting uh, by the bohemian artist Henry Faulkner. Uh, we sold a piece of work uh, from him earlier this year in another landmark sale, and I enjoyed learning about uh, his unusual backstory and the, the company that Faulkner kept. So tell us about it, guys. First of all, I love the name Keredith for us. So. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to steal that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, a lot of you may know we've sold several Henry Faulkner paintings, um, and uh, this one's pretty spectacular. Uh, Faulkner was an orphan and a listless wanderer. Uh, the artist lived a very bohemian lifestyle, but eventually settled in Lexington, so he has a lot of uh, local interest. He blossomed relationships with people like Ernest Hemingway and Tennessee Williams and other icons of art and literature but he was quite an eccentric person and someone I would have wanted to know. Um, but he's also notable because he brought a bourbon drinking goat to parties. That was his pet Alice, or pet goat Alice. And um, he's now remembered as a brilliant poet and artist. So this is our painting that we have. It's really exceptional. It's in one of my opinion, in my opinion, one of the best Faulkners we've ever had. It's called uh, Reflections of Alice. And you can see it does show Alice at the top of the staircase here. Um, and he also brought Alice, you know, to gallery openings and parties. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I love his work because I feel like his um, eccentric personality really comes out in his work. For sure. This piece is so whimsical. It is. I love how the flowers almost float up above the staircase over Alice's eyes as she looks longingly at her reflection in the mirror, which is where the painting got its title. It's almost as if the hearts are popping out of her eyes like bubbles. <laughs> Yeah. Um, something else that he featured in his works um, was a painted border, and you can see that in, the, in this example. He's decorated it with this curvilinear kind of pattern here. Um, Meredith, I think you said it was one of your favorite parts. For sure, <laughs> aside from Alice, of course. The color of the green painted frame is a great contrast to the turquoise, <laughs> and I love that the frame that he painted has these swirly shapes that kind of move around the frame. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something else that's worth noting about this piece is it, it's presented in its, in its original frame. And you can tell because if you get some details uh, of the frame here, there's actually some green paint and, and spots of paint on the frame. So something that Faulkner would do is he would buy his frames from thrift stores and you know put the board in the frame directly and then start painting um, with the board in the frame. So I think it makes it even more special in this case um, that we have it presented in the way that the artist envisioned it to be presented. So. And so far, this has gained a lot of um, bids. It's at $13,250 currently. Great. That's awesome. All right. So while we're here, I wanted to tell you about this amazing Mexican modernist sterling silver oval centerpiece bowl. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it's worth mentioning because of the size and the weight. It's art deco, and it's a classic form, and I just think that it's so stunning. So I wanted to show that to you today. So let's touch on some of the other unique sterling here. I know uh, these things have kind of caught your attention. Uh, the your peacocks <laughs> are my personal favorite. Um, they're German, and they're 800 silver. They're actually spice boxes. What I love so much about them is the detail on their tails. But my favorite part is that their heads pop off. <laughs> Which is a great party trick. Where you could store your spices <laughs> in the awesome. early 20th century. Awesome. Thank you so much, Meredith. Uh, I see lots of sparkle and shine. Uh, Jen and Tanya have a little bit more to share because uh, jewelry always features pretty good in these landmark sales. 
Yes, Palmer, we're back. Lots <laughs> of sparkle and shine. Actually, a little fun fact, I think we have just about 65 carats of diamonds just on this tray alone. So anyway, one of my favorite pieces on, on the tray is this, um, is this vintage uh, 18 karat gold and diamond feather, which it's just, it's so delicate. It, it's absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Um, but then the other thing that catches your attention on this tray is the yellow diamond ring. Yes. Tanya, yes. I know you've got a lot to say about wow. that. Okay. I do, I do because it's very rare to find a fancy yellow diamond. First of all, a fancy yellow diamond above six carats phenomenal. Um, I think there's a misnomer out there that diamonds are readily available. They are if they're minor diamonds or something you're going to use on a drill bit. Diamonds, fine diamonds like this are not that rare. I mean are not that available and something like this is exceedingly rare. When you get over three carats any diamond is pretty rare. So this is over six, beautiful yellow color, fancy light yellow and an octagonal cut which is very very rare. Um, fantastic faceting on it really exceptional ring. Uh, it's also flanked by two beautiful side diamonds. Gorgeous piece. I think um, several people like it because I think that ring is currently at fifteen thousand dollars. Yes. Yes. So, and any, anyway, yeah. and there's many other beautiful things here. I mean, mm -hmm. this pearl, this pearl necklace with the tassels. Yeah. I've never seen pearls in that color. They're like a beautiful blush pink, yes. and they're huge. Yes, they are huge. These are. Um, for a torsade of this type, you would literally have to um, wait to get all these uh, pearls so well matched. It probably took years and years That's to amazing. make this actual length. Um, what I love is it is a lariat style, so it can be worn hanging long, or it can be you can remove this and 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 double it up. But to get such a, a good match on the pearls like that would have taken quite some time. Um, it also incredible work on this with the diamonds and the rubies in all these areas, and then the beautiful tassels on the end, on the end with the white, uh, white pearls. It's just an incredibly well done piece. Really beautiful. Another, and the, this pair of earrings is also yes. really elegant. Those oh, are beautiful. Yes, uh, bring in September. If we get to see more sapphires like this, which is the birthstone of September, I'm all for it. Um, I would wear these, and I'm not a September baby. These are absolutely huge, gorgeous sapphires. These would go great with that ring. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, absolutely beautiful. Again, very clear sapphires. These are the t these are the finest sapphires that you can get. Um, really beautiful pair of earrings. Yeah. Those are lovely. And since tassel, the, with the tassels being a theme on this tray, um, it would be, you know, we, we really should point out yes. this, this great little uh, Yves Saint Laurent handbag. Uh, it's a monogram handbag with Yves Saint Laurent's monogram right down the center. Uh, the tassel in the center, it's a great size. Your cell phone will fit in there and a lipstick. And um, it's, um, oops, sorry, uh, with its original box and uh, the dust bag is in there. and. Can't go wrong with that. You could dress it up. You could wear it with jeans and heels. It's just a great little handbag. So anyway, fun tray. I think fun, so too. Fun, fun bunch of stuff. That's that's amazing and impressive. I saw those uh, sapphire earrings had 34 bids and uh, we're currently at uh, 900 uh, 900 dollars. So excellent. Uh, stunning, stunning stuff. Thank you guys. Thank and you. the handbags in this collection are just on another level. So. Uh, I think we have a few more of those to sneak in maybe later. Uh, there's more incredible art to share. Also, uh, we actually have two pieces uh, from the next artist to feature. Uh, Kara is going to come on and talk to us about that. Let me grab this one. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're lucky to have two paintings by the Cincinnati-based artist Edward Henry Pothast. And you can see one is a seascape, and the other is of Central Park, which is one you have. And this was po possibly a study for a larger painting. Um, but Pothast often painted seascapes and beach scenes. That's really what he was known for um, and his impressionistic style. The seascape is a beautiful example of uh, his work as it's painted. You can see with these very long gestural brush strokes and a very textural impasto here that he likely painted with a, a palette knife. I mean, the color is what like, grabs me the most first, and then you like, get in that next layer and you really see the technique. It's, yeah, uh, the colors it's, are it's, so it's vibrant, noteworthy. and they just have such a presence here. Um, and you can see it's also beautifully presented in this gold tone arts and crafts style frame. Awesome. So while we're here, I think somebody uh, had a question about the Angel Boteo piece. Yes, that's up here. So we want to. So a bitter, uh, you know, wanted to see some close-ups of this of this painting by Angel Boteo. He was a Puerto Rican artist, and he was considered actually the Caribbean Paul Gauguin. 
And this is a very abstract modernist example of his work with very um, geometric kind of shapes and angular figures. It's of a mother and, and child. Um, but if you do look at um, some auction records of his work, um, some of his figural and genre pieces do very much resemble the post-impressionist and symbolist paintings that Paul Gauguin painted of his Tahitian subjects. Uh, but this particular one is oil and acrylic on masonite board. Awesome. Beautiful works uh, from two very different artists. Mm -hmm. uh, that pot has, I think, uh, the seascapes, uh, 61 bids and currently at uh, $4,150. So uh, I think we, were, we had a few questions that maybe came through that we were going to look at here. Uh, let me see what we got. You're feeding me some stuff. All right. I think uh, the Duncanson, there was a question about the Duncanson. Carrie, do you want to maybe help handle this one? Uh, they were asking about you know, what the connection between Duncanson and the Taft Museum was. Yeah, so in the 1850s, Duncanson was commissioned by the abolitionist and political leader Nicholas Longworth to paint an extensive series of murals for the main entrances of his home called the Belmont Home. And that's actually now the Taft Museum of Art. Those, were his, those murals were uh, his most notable accomplishment in his career and the largest pieces he, he painted. Um, and he actually painted, if, if you see the murals, um, he painted these trompe l'oeil architectural frames around them. Um, and they have those curved edges, just like um, in the actual frame we have in the, in the painting that we're selling in this auction. So you can tell that was very much a preferred frame style for him. So. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kara. Yeah. Uh, a couple other questions. Uh, somebody was asking about the chandelier, uh, that crystal uh, cut, ch or cut glass chandelier. Uh, 200 pounds is how much it weighs uh, in the crate. Uh, there was a question about the Dodge Woody, uh, about how it runs, uh, and it does run. Uh, I mean, I will note it's a 1949, so it's a bit different than a modern car. Uh, there's a starter pedal above the accelerator, that you, and you actually have to pull the choke. But once it's started, uh, and it seems to run pretty well. So uh, a couple questions there. And then I think there was one on Instagram uh, about antiques. There are a lot of antiques in here. Jen, do you want to come out? I think we have a beautiful one, a chest right here, that we could talk a little bit more about. Uh, and we can give you a little detail there, but there are and there are some other antiques featured in the sale as well. Sure, we have lots of antique silver, we have antique porcelain, um, but actually we chose this piece as our centerpiece on the stage tonight because it's it's beautiful. Um, it is English uh, chest on stand. Uh, we have it dated to the 18th century and later because we do believe that the stand um, is is the later piece, is the later edition. But it's beautiful nonetheless. It has the barley twist legs. It has that you know telltale stretcher, uh, the bun feet, and then of course uh, the it's considered William and Mary style because of the uh, teardrop um, hardware on it. And just in general, it has a great patina. Uh, it's, a, it's just a beautiful piece. It's beautiful. And currently, 31 bids, uh, $1,150. So Correct. Uh, a very cool piece. And you're out here. Do uh, we have any other questions out there uh, that came in? Anything uh, coming in? All right. Well, let's, uh, I mean, I think we've sort of ignored something on the, on the thing here. <laughs> yes. A little bit of a finale. You want to help well, talk about I, it? Let, let's do the... Uh, we have the house of Chanel that's well represented this <laughs> evening. Uh, so we have a couple of Chanel pieces uh, to my left. Uh, of course, the uh, double-breasted coat with the Chanel monogram buttons. Uh, we have this great little coat. This is Chanel as well. Uh, it's in uh, red and blue on this kind of an ivory check with toggle buttons and a great hood, which is a fun kind of fashion forward and trending uh, design trend. Uh, we've got this great little cross body bag with the Chanel with the interlocking C's uh, emblem across the front and then of course our piece de la resistance I always trip over that um, the uh, the boy bag the boy brick bag in red on ivory with these uh, pearl accents and of course the uh, optional yeah optional that thing's chain. striking I think yeah it would, this is uh, a lot of, this is a lot sure. of fun and it's getting a lot of attention it's currently at five thousand dollars and I think I'm reading that it 64 has about 64 bids. bids. Yep. Exactly. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Jen. You're uh, welcome. Any other questions uh, out there, guys? All right. Wow. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed that. It has been fun to have these amazing things around the office and uh, very exciting to watch the momentum build on this sale. Uh, be sure to follow your favorites and don't forget we will be live again this Sunday at uh, 755 Eastern to help guide you through the action. Join us on live.ebth.com to bid on all the items ending in the autumn landmark 
the, the Leung Weinstein Estate, which we shared with you guys on Monday, uh, and other sales featuring uh, the Uncommon. If you have any questions between now and then, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we love talking about the stuff. Uh, remember, Sunday during the ending the Leung, of the Leung Weinstein Estate, we will, uh, this will be your chance to be featured on our t upcoming TV series. Uh, hop on live.ebth.com and turn on the video feature in the upper right corner. Uh, make sure your ca uh, camera's set up somewhere fun. Make sure you stand out from the crowd, and it'll help our uh, producers. It'll help catch their eye and make sure you get a chance to be on that show. Uh, it's going to be an exciting day on Sunday, so come stop on by and come watch uh, these unbelievable pieces uh, come to an end in the auction. So until Sunday, keep living the uncommon life. Happy bidding.